Welcome everyone to the second to last part in this winter webinar series. Um, this part will be about honey. It's gonna be about honey extraction, honey processing. We have a really wonderful panel for you today. Um, but before we jump into that, uh, just a few little reminders. Uh, attendees, if you have a question or a comment, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A. It's in the bottom right, it just says Q&A, and you can type your questions there. We'll try our best to answer all of them, uh, and we'll try our best to answer all of them live for you. So we'll, we'll be asking our panelists those questions. Uh, you can also use the chat. Feel free to post comments in the chat. We'll also monitor it for questions should anyone um, type something in there. And I'll also uh, just be asking a few icebreakers along the way uh, using the chat. So uh, use those as much as you want to. And, uh, and that's, um, I guess that's all the instruction I have for now. Before we start, uh, attendees, I have a really quick icebreaker for you. As this, is, this uh, section today is about honey, I'm really curious to know uh, how, how do you, all, or sorry, what questions um, are most, um, what questions do you have about honey? Any, any question at all? What, what are you curious about with honey? What, um, what kind of questions do you have? Why are you here today? So feel free to uh, use the, the Q&A there, or pardon me, the uh, chat, uh, and just type any old question you have. So for example, I'm gonna ask, why is honey so sweet? There's an example one for you right there. So feel free to uh, throw us any questions you have. Why are you here today? What, what interests you about honey? What do you like about honey? And as you're doing that, uh, I'm gonna just quickly introduce our next, uh, pardon me, our first speaker. There we go. So, uh, Right, we've got three uh, sections today. We've got uh, a beekeeper from Toronto. We've got an urban beekeeper. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, we've got an urban beekeeper here today from Toronto. That's Tom Nolan. And Tom's gonna talk to us today about his uh, honey extraction and uh, processing um, pipeline and, and how he works in an urban space. We've got Allison uh, McGovern and Eric Kurtilak. Uh, Allison and Eric join us today from Purdue. And they were actually, um, the key personnel responsible for boiler bee honey, so Purdue's new uh, honey program. And then finally, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, finish things off with Matt Evans. Matt joins us uh, from Indiana, and Matt is a commercial beekeeper. So he's gonna show us some videos of, of, their, of the commercial operation he runs uh, and how, uh, how his operation works. So this is a really good opportunity for you to see um, three different scales of process. So it's kind of a small, medium, and large sized operations uh, and ask uh, questions from a really um, uh, experientially diverse uh, uh, group of people today. We've got some food scientists, Allison and Eric, we've got uh, uh, very experienced beekeepers who work on very different scales. So this should be a really fun, um, fun series today. So lots of questions coming in, this is great. And we're gonna actually make sure to answer all of those uh, throughout the day. Um, just keep them coming. All right, <clears throat> so let's kick things off with Tom. Uh, Tom, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you take over. Tom's gonna talk to us today about urban beekeeping. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us uh, from Toronto today, Tom. Pleasure, thanks for having me, Brock. It's exciting to be here. Just give me a little second, get... Uh... Okay, so you guys can all see my screen? Sure can. Okay, audio's on. Okay, just briefly, a little bit. Uh, I'm a hobbyist, small scale beekeeper. My wife and I, we operate uh, Hive Town Honey in, uh, in Toronto. And uh, today I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges and benefits we have uh, in an urban environment and also live in, in the city and in a small apartment uh, dealing with the challenges we have extra extracting and processing our honey. Um, I currently, uh, we have three apiaries uh, with a total of 28 colonies. Um, uh, picture here with my wife is our University of Toronto apiary, uh, their suburban Scarborough campus. We keep about 15 colonies there. On the bottom right is our only apiary that's not a rooftop. We have eight there. This is in an area called the Rouge Valley, which is close to the Toronto Zoo some excellent forage there. And uh, top right 
is our University of Toronto downtown campus. There's only three in the photo, but we actually have five colonies on that roof. Um, last year, coming out of the winter, we had 10 colonies. So our 28 colonies are all a result of our splitting our, our, our 10 that we came out with. So we're not buying bees, we're making splits, but I do buy queens. Um, okay. So let's get into uh, right how we deal with our honey. In this photo, uh, for those of you who may, may or may not be uh, familiar with, I use bee escapes to get the um, honey off my uh, colonies. So we use a triangle bee escape. It is, um, this is the device here. For those of you who are not familiar with it, you put it on over the brood box, the supers are above. It's kind of like a one-way trip. The bees can go through to get back to the, get back to the um, brood box, but they can't get back up to the honey supers. So we want to be able to bring those boxes home without having bees in them because I am processing them in my apartment, not in a, uh, not in a dedicated honey, honey, uh, honey house. Here's the biggest challenge I have uh, processing my honey. Our main, our, our main rooftop apiary at the University of Toronto, uh, this gray door, I take an elevator up to the third floor. Once I get to this door, I've got two flights of stairs to deal with to get up onto the roof, which I go through a mechanical room. So going up with empty supers is the easy part. Coming back down with full supers is uh, quite challenging, but you know, that's the challenge. The benefit is no bears, no vandalism, security, 24 hour access. So, um, and surprisingly the bees do very well up there. The, um, you can see, you can see in the, in the previous photo, the, uh, the black tar roof. Uh, some days it's really unpleasant for the beekeeper, but I don't see any negative impact. The bees really, really do well up there. Okay, so once I get that honey off the roof and I get it home in my apartment, again, I live in a small apartment without a dedicated room. I rent a storage locker, I keep my equipment, I haul that extractor up, you know, once a year to do my extraction. And um, that's a deal when you're a hobbyist beekeeper living in an apartment. <laughs> So here's a picture of my dining room. This is round one uh, in July. I do two extractions, one in July, one in August. I do not have a lot of room. I make do with what I have. <laughs> we get it done. Um, here's, uh, here's my wife uh, getting started doing the uncapping process. Talk about kind of a little bit of evolution and changes I've gone through there. Um, started off using this hot knife, which we still periodically do. In this photo, you'll see my wife using a new, it's a very new uncapping tool, which we decided to try. Works quite well if the honey is warm. In July, when I do my first round, I pulled the honey right off the, uh, right off the roof, got it home and extracted it the same day. Did not need the hot knife. The honey was warm, easy to uncap, easy to process. Uh, my second round in August, I had it sitting in the dining room for a couple of days. Um, that tool did not work, this tool did not work so well. I needed to go back to the hot knife. A couple other things you'll notice in this photo. Um, my wife is uncapping into a stack of pails there. <laughs> the way I do it is the top pail here um, has the bottom cut out. I have these spacers to elevate it and there's a five gallon strainer, a paint strainer in there. So as she's uncapping, the wax is falling into this strainer and there's enough space underneath that the honey drips down into the bottom. So that's how I deal with my uncappings. If that bag gets full, I'll stop in the middle of the process, pull it off, put it in a bucket, put a new bag. Um, another thing I made a little change with is when we extract, if you'll notice there's a pail under the extractor, I don't have a filter there. I used to use the metal uh, sieves, the, the strainers, and I found that just slowed down the process. So what I do now is I go directly into the plastic five gallon pail. Once it's full, I let it sit for a couple of days. All the uh, wax will float to the top. And then I usually strain that through a strainer, a metal strainer and a, into a second pail. 
So I do that after extracting, not during extracting. And that extractor I have there is a uh, 12 frame manual extractor. So I know a lot of people buy a couple of hives and think they need a electric extractor, but I'm managing to do 28 colonies with the manual extractor. Um, okay, here's a little close up tool, this uncapping tool. I don't know what they call it. It's a relatively new tool. It just showed up a couple of years ago and, and I like it. It works quite well. I also use the traditional uh, scratcher. It's such a close up a 12 frame manual extractor. I have a couple inserts. I, I myself personally just use medium boxes, medium frames. And again, the reason for that is because I'm on a rooftop and I'm doing a lot of slugging boxes up and down stairs. So just for that reason alone, I don't extract deep frames. If I, if I have a couple, I can put an insert in there and that, that extractor is capable of also uh, manually doing deep frames. Um, when I store my honey, I don't mix. So each yard I store separately, so I don't mix my honey. So I know that, you know, if it's this honey is from the University of Toronto Scarborough, this one's from downtown, or this one's from the Rouge Valley. Also, if I do two extractions at different times, like if I extract in July and I extract end of August, I don't mix those. I like to keep the, uh, the sort of varietals as different as possible. Um, Manually jar it. That's, you know, I have nothing automated. Every, everything is manual. I manually jar it. One quirk my wife has that, you know, um, is that although it's not necessary, she washes and boils our jars before we, um, before we fill our jars. Not every beekeeper does that. There is some sort of debate whether that's really necessary, but that's what we choose to do. And it gets, you know, the more honey we produce every year, the more challenging it gets. But that, that's, that's kind of where we're at with that. Um, once my honey is extracted, we have the challenge of what do we do with our wet supers? And there's basically three options. Put the supers back on the hives for the bees to clean up, put them in the bee yard for the bees that can also clean up, or store them wet, as many commercial beekeepers do. When you've got a couple of hives in your backyard, it's quite easy to put them back on the hive or let the bees clean them up. This photo is from a couple of years ago. Um, I used to put them on the roof, let the bees clean up the wet supers. I don't do that anymore. I store them wet. I make sure they're secure underneath with the queen excluder so no mice or rodents get in. I wrap them in plastic. I, you know, I make sure there's no wax moth or anything like that, but now, now I store wet. It's just, just my choice. Um, once my honey is pulled, I basically, uh, I run single brood boxes, in, in, which is fairly common here in Ontario, Canada. Um, but once my honey is pulled in August, because I run singles, it's critical to start feeding right away to prepare the bees for winter. Um, I, um, I use pale top feeders. Again, there's lots of ways to feed your bees in high feeders. Some people open feed. I like the pale feeder. Um, but again, running single brood boxes, it's pretty critical that that's done in a, in a timely fashion. Um, a little close up of the, uh, the feeders that I use. Um, basically, once my honey's pulled, the um, bees are fed. You know, what I've learned here in, in, in Ontario where we can get quite cold is Weather is really a small, a small part of whether the bees will survive the winter. I think bees need to be strong, healthy, well-fed, proper size. Um, so that's me running through my process very briefly as a hobbyist. Um, Tom, that was, oh, am I muted? There we go. Tom, that was really awesome. Uh, thank you. I, I love seeing uh, the, uh, the rooftop struggle, the stairs, uh, <laughs> and all the effort you have to go through to um, to extract honey living in a in a city as dense as Toronto. Uh, you've got a ton of questions here, uh, and as people keep typing them, I'm going to ask uh, one that I had, and also that Chris. Um, sorry, Chris, I'm probably going to pronounce your last name incorrectly, but it's Bill Yu. Uh, so Chris and I were both curious. Uh, how long do you actually have to crank the honey um, when you're on your manual uh, extractor? Yeah, I, um, before the honey season, I tell people, I don't know why you need an electric extractor. 
every time <laughs> I crank that, I said to my wife, we got to buy an electric extractor next year. Um, it's getting tough. It's getting tough with the, with uh, 28 colonies, you know, extracting 20, 30, sometimes more boxes of honey. Uh, my arm really feels it. I, so I usually got to crank. Um, yeah, it's long. It, it, it's a good, it's a good 10 minutes, 15 minutes, which doesn't sound long, but when you're doing it, you know, for a few hours, like sometimes it'll take me four or five or six hours to extract all my honey. Uh, yeah, my arm's feeling it. My wife does yeah. the uncapping, I do the spinning. Um, on that note, I plan to grow a little bit next year. I will probably set up a mobile extraction facility in a trailer or have one of my commercial friends extract my honey for me. But if I'm doing it myself, I'll definitely be purchasing a, an electric extractor. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so some other questions here. Uh, let's see. Oh, actually, I, I, I'm going to use one more. So something you're giving your talk in Toronto, uh, and I guess some of the the practice that you do there is going to be a little bit different, both because you're urban and because you don't have some of the pests we have. So um, you don't have small hive beetle, do you? Um, well, we're in the early stages of small high beetle. Sm small high beetle a couple of years ago was found in our, our sort of uh, Niagara region. And uh, last year, we didn't have anybody in the urban area, um, probably couldn't even identify a small high beetle because no one's ever seen them. Um, that is changing with the people mm. selling nukes and buying nukes and, and shifting around. And, um, we're starting to see it. I mean, I've seen small high beetle in other people's colonies. I've yet to experience it myself, my own, but um, yeah, I think it's only a matter of time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's certainly, uh, in moving here, I've noticed that that's a big change to the, to the uh, extraction process, is just how, to, how long one can leave empty, um, that is empty of bees, frames uh, sitting out. Um, yeah, so Debbie Becker had another question to everyone, and, and Debbie was curious about um, already crystallized honey. So do you extract, and how do you deal with honey that's crystallized in the frames? Yeah, personally, I haven't had to experience that myself because, you know, my whole, my whole management philosophy is get it off right away, get it extracted right away. Yeah, so it's not okay. something I've really had to deal with. Okay. Uh, and then one more, uh, I'll just give you one more and then we can save some for the end here. John uh, Newfeld was curious about the best way to decap honey. So you had, <clears throat> I think you showed three different methods there, maybe even four different methods of uncapping. Yeah. Maybe you want to go through your best to worst. <laughs> yeah. Um, the traditional uncapping, I'm just a scratcher, you know, the, the fork style scratcher. Um, I know it's very common and widely used. I don't like it. It, it you know, the, um, the hot knife actually is, is my choice. Although that new capper that you pull across uh, in the photo I showed, that, that's quite interesting, but it only works well if the uh, honey is warm. One of the things I've done and many, many beekeepers do to make the uncapping process much easier is although all my brood box are standard 10 frames in the box, in my honey supers, you know, when you're starting off as a hobbyist, Clearly, you need the 10 frames in the box, but once my frames are in my honey supers are drawn, I go to nine frames in the box, mainly because with the nine frames, the bees can draw that wax and honey out thicker, which makes it easier to uncap. So when I switched from the, from the 10 to nine frames in the box, it became much easier to uncap. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good point. Um, regulating the frame sizes. Uh, I, I guess, so you were talking about the thickness of the honey, and this actually kind of lends itself nicely to a question that was asked by uh, Donna in the Q&A. And Donna was curious about how you test or if you test your moisture levels in the honey that you're extracting. Yes, I do. I, I, yeah, I didn't have a photo. I, I have one of the uh, s simple hygrometers that I use, and um, it's, it's always a concern because, <clears throat> one, I, I, my preference is to only pull honey when it's fully capped. But in the real world, sometimes that's challenging. So it, if my honey is, it's got to be at least, you know, 75% cap. And I'll, that's when I'm really looking at the moisture levels. So I, I use the, uh, the um, I don't know the particular brand, but it, it's, uh, it wasn't the cheapest one. I think I paid about a hundred bucks for mine. 
a, a refractometer? Refractometer, sorry, yeah. I said hygrometer, okay. I mean, yeah, refractometer. Okay, okay. Um, okay, one more question. This is a really easy one. This is from Virginia. Uh, how much uh, honey per, uh, how many pounds of honey per hive are you getting in, in Toronto? Well, that's a good question. Um, last year, I averaged about 85 pounds per colony. This year, it's down to about 55. But there's two reasons for that. Last year, I had a lot less colonies, and there were big, strong colonies. This year, I split my colonies to go from 10 to 28. So one, my colonies were not as strong as they were the year before. And two, we had this really hot, dry summer that impacted the honey yields. So that gives you a sort of an indication from one year to the other, going from 85 to 55. Okay, okay. Tom, you're getting a, a bunch of questions here, but I'm, what I'm gonna do is save some of these till the end, and then we can ask them of the whole panel as well. Uh, so thank you very much. That was, that was really great to see that. I love the photos and the experience. Um, my back is aching thinking about carrying all those, those frames up and downstairs all day, but that's great. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having me, Brock. <clears throat> so uh, just as, uh, as Tom, uh, switches off and we'll get Eric and Allison to switch on. Eric and Allison are joining us from Purdue, as I said before. Uh, they have been running the, uh, Boiler Bee Honey program. And so they're actually starting with their um, extraction process right at extraction. So I, I came to them with, uh, with all of our supers from Purdue and I said, we really want to make a, a, a product for the university here. We wanna make um, boiler bee honey. And so Eric and Allison are uh, two wonderful food scientists and uh, they really, they put their heads together and came up with, um, with kind of a fun, a fun process for us. So it's, it's been a great learning experience and I'm, I'm very excited to have them both here today. So I'm gonna put myself on mute and pass it over to them. Okay, um, I'm gonna have uh, Allison lead most of the conversation here. So as uh, Brock had explained, this is a collaboration between entomology and food science. And so I'll be kind of steering the slides, but taking cues from, from Allison. It's been a really excellent, excellent experience, and it's kind of a nice way for us to expose some of our students and emerging professionals to different things they'll have to consider in commercial food processing. Um, I'd like to consider ourselves to be kind of in the middle ground where we're not full on commercial scale, uh, but we're certainly larger in terms of scale than uh, hobbyists. Um, so Allison, why don't you go ahead and take it away and We'll go through the slides and off we go. Perfect. <laughs> so um, as Eric was saying, this um, Boiler Bee Honey Project is a collaboration between the entomology and food science department here at Purdue. And through this process, we've had to do a lot of things as you can see here in our process overview. So our first step of the process is to collect the hives from the entomology department and their apiary. Um, they bring all the hives over to the Department of Food Science in our pilot plant facility, um, which houses different processing equipment for the food industry in Indiana and across the nation. Um, so we collect all of our hives into the pilot plant brewery, and we hold that room at about 100 degrees Fahrenheit to warm the honey up so it doesn't crystallize um, in the frames as it was kind of asked before in the prior presentation. Um, and after we hold the honey for about a day or two, we go into the uncapping and extraction process of the honey um, manually, of course, and we have an electric um, extractor and a centrifuge. And after we extract the honey, we go into a product resting period just to have it settle and to make sure there isn't any crystallization before we go into the thermal process. And we do thermally process our honey um, it is not a food safety risk of honey. It is just to extend the shelf life and to inhibit the crystallization of the honey as it goes through. Um, and it is kind of replicative of a commercial honey process um, with the thermal treatment we do on our honey, um, just to make sure that we can keep the integrity of it without scorching it and making it darker than we want it to be. And through the process, we go through screening. So I will show you later on, we have inline screens to um, make sure that our honey is pure and it is clear from any bee parts or anything within the process that could enter our product stream. 
And lastly, we go into our bottling and our sealing. So we do seal our eight ounce bottles of honey with an induction sealer, as you will see later on. And then we package them and we sell them in the butcher block here on campus. All right. And our thermal process, uh, we're running our process at 176 Fahrenheit, but only one minute of exposure. So we start at 100 Fahrenheit, we bring it up to 176, we hold it for one minute and we drop it right back down to 100. So we're trying to make sure that we've uh, knocked out any kind of a yeast that is gonna cause end of shelf life. We're trying to inhibit the crystallization. Um, and then of course, um, we also want to make sure we have good viscosity, good easy flow as we're going through our inline screens. And then we knock that heat off as fast as we can so that we get it into a, a, a condition back at 100 Fahrenheit where we're not gonna degrade the product. Yes, so as we can see here, um, we do have a lot of planning that goes into this product. Um, as food scientists, we need to ensure that the product will be safe to the public. Um, so we do have a lot of food safety requirements that we meet within this process. Um, we do have a certified facility um, through the state of Indiana. So we are wholesale approved for this honey. And that is very important to ensure that we are putting a safe regulated product on the market um, and not harming any consumers in this process. Um, so we have a flow diagram process flow that we follow with our equipment. We need to build, clean, sanitize the whole process to ensure that it is safe for the consumer. And we do operate on a processing line. So we have a full kind of mini scale commercial um, honey process going on where we go from extraction to bottling. And we have to make sure that every step of that process is accounted for within the co-dating of the process, the lots tracking to make sure if something does happen, we can go back and see where it may have gone wrong. So we have that evidence to back up our product. Um, and we do manage all the paperwork. We wanna make sure that we have a record to improve for the following years to come, as well to any consumers who do have questions about their, our product. And lastly, we do provide a pre-process and post-process sanitation like you would see in any commercial food plant in the food industry. Um, it is very important to have a clean, sanitized area to prevent any foreign materials or microbial risk involved to get into our product so we can make sure again um, that we're selling a high quality product. Okay, uh, a couple of videos here. So in this video, yeah, in this video, um, so we are showing in our brewery that we have at Purdue inside the pilot plant. Um, we have a centrifuge here where we are loading all of the frames by hand. And this streams over to our extractor. So we are entering the frames at the extractor. And then also on the other side, we have um, all of our frames lined up near the end of that clip. Um, so we do keep everything in this room. We do consolidate it to one location within the plant to ensure that we can easily manually um, switch from the extractor to the centrifuge um, and start loading uh, pails and drums of the honey. Um, it is a very hands-on process for us. It requires a lot of um, students and um, different people from the food science department and entomology grad students and undergrads come together and get this process done. And as you can see on the video that's playing now, we are uncapping. So after we go through the electric uncapper, we do go by hand with tools to make sure that all of the caps are uncapped. Um, I personally like that we do this because it ensures that we get every ounce of honey. And our little motto is every ounce counts. So we try very hard to make sure that is maintained. And it also kind of is like a check, um, kind of in a uh, food safety term, it's kind of an inspection to make sure that our hives are good to go for um, centrifuge. There is a hot knife uh, at the bottom of this feeder. And so as the frames pass through, um, there's resistance from that hot knife and the, the wax just drops into the trough. And we end up getting a pretty nice yield on, uh, on beeswax as well. Um, but it is very, very important to have that visual inspection to make sure to open any remaining caps and make sure we keep any beetles um, or other contaminants out of that uh, centrifugal extractor. 
So in this just a little shot of it running. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just the centrifuge running. And then this is just um, the honey coming out of the centrifuge. And we do have a sieve there um, within a five gallon food safe drum, um, just to be able to strain any bee particulates out of the honey. So here we have the storage. Um, so we have the sieves for our straining process and then Eric can talk about the storage. Yeah, we would store in 30 gallon drums here. So these are actually 30 gallon drums. This is 106 gallon uh, jacket, uh, jacketed tank here. Oh, actually that one's not jacketed, but we had um, some cheese vats uh, that we were using this year that were really nice because those were jacketed open vessels. So we had different uh, vats and tanks that we've used uh, over the years. If we're going away from the 30 gallon drums. We are, uh, they don't have a spigot or any kind of an outlet valve. And so we don't like the idea of having to bail out of those when we've already cleaned up the product. They're a little bit of a bear to move around. So anything that has an outlet and is gonna be gravity fed is gonna make your life easier um, because you can gravity feed right into a transfer pump you don't want to run your pump dry, so that's going to keep everything primed and then just move it through. So we've got a lot of different options in holding. We want to let air escape from the product. And when we are holding, uh, generally it's a couple of days. Um, we did uh, some extraction. I, I want to say the extraction was on Friday, and then we did the, the thermal process on Monday and just held it over the weekend. So that was enough to allow some separation, any particulates to come up some air to release, um, and then we went ahead and did the thermal process. So we'll go to the next slide here. And that is the whole system, but I'll let Allison speak to this. This is the beauty. So we have our system here that we um, built within the pilot plant. So the pilot plant crew um, helped build this together, which also goes back to the student engagement in this project. Um, so we have here a pump and there is a funnel there at the top um, where we are manually taking from those drums and putting them into the hopper um, in order to maintain the flowability through the process and make sure our pump does not run dry. Um, if you do have a pump that runs dry, you can run into many issues. Um, so it's very important to have it primed um, the system before you put your new product in. And it goes through the process. So we have, like Eric's showing, we have a flow meter here um, and that goes through back to a hold tube. And the flow meter is important to make sure that we have a consistent flowability of the honey. Um, I believe we were running about two gallons per minute um, mm -hmm. and we would flow that through. And honey is very viscous. So in our product, we have to go through this coil that Eric is pointing to now. And that is a heat treated coil. So there is like a hot water or any type of media. You could do steam, I believe, as well um, on the outside of the coil. And then the honey is inside, so it's kind of a multi-tube. And it goes down through this whole tube like Eric is showing now. Um, and that is a regulated length um, and height that we have to have in order to have the proper requirements of a whole tube within a thermal process. So we go through that and then after that it goes down into um, out of the coil into hoses and gets hosed into our piston filler. We do have uh, two coils in the stack. We have a warm coil on the inside and we're trying to make sure that that honey coming in here it's 100 Fahrenheit and it's rolling from the bottom up, we, we load the product low. So if there's any trapped air in the tubing that it gets pushed out. So a double tube heat exchanger is what we're using. And so we have a tube run inside another tube. The outside tube, that's the jacket. That's where we're gonna have all of that hot water running through. So that water is gonna be a little higher than 200 Fahrenheit. We're gonna run the product through. And as we leave the coil, we're gonna grab a temperature and make sure that we have enough temperature to run through this hold tube. The hold tube provides the time because in a thermal process, the temperature is not enough. You have to have time and temperature working together. So we have a critical check at the end of the hold tube to make sure that we had correct time and temperature. 
Then we run back to the outer coil that you can see clearly visible. That's going to have just potable water running in, in that jacket. And it's going to knock down that temperature from that 176 at the end of the hold tube. It's going to knock it down to 100. And like uh, Allison said, you have a lot of viscosity change when you're switching uh, you know, from different temperatures. One of the one of the challenges was we got some crystallization in the in the honey as it was running through the outer tube um, because we were chilling it too fast and too far and overshooting the mark. We were getting much colder than 100 Fahrenheit in certain parts of the fluid flow. Um, so we had to make some adjustments on the fly to make that work, but it did work really, really well in this approach. And these inline screens are right here at the end of the hold tube, at the end of the hold tube, you've seen your full temperature, you've seen your full time, you got the best fluid dynamics possible, screen it right there. And we screen it right there and we have um, pressure regulators uh, to monitor what's happening inside that piping because the screen gets blocked. We're gonna have a lot of pressure building from this drive pump and we have to make sure to watch out for safety. So we have here um, our inline screens as Eric was talking about. Um, and those are important once again to make sure that we do not have any particulates um, near the outlet of this whole process of the honey. And it is important to manage with the pressure gauges as you can see to make sure you don't exceed a certain pressure um, because that can harm the product as well as the system. And over here on the right, we have a piston filler and we have a sight glass in there so we can see the color of the honey as it comes out of the thermal process to make sure that it isn't um, overly heated to ruin the integrity of it. We want a golden color honey. We don't want a darkened um, product that will not appeal to what people think of honey when they see it on the shelf, um, comparing that to a commercially um, produced honey that you get at the store. Um, and so this hopper is into a piston filler and there's a filling here um, and it goes through a piston and we line it up so it can fill the eight ounce bottles. And I really love this piston filler because last year when we first started out, I had to manually with a hose over my shoulder go and fill every bottle individually. So this is very nice um, addition. Thank you to Purdue Dining um, for this filler. And on the right, we have an induction sealer. So all of our bottles are sealed, as you can see that white kind of seal on that test bottle um, to ensure that we do have a sealed product. Um, there is no real risk if you don't have a sealed honey product, but um, again, for consumer um, liking and for just an extra level of safety from outside things, we have it. And you can see below that we did labeling um, and because of COVID-19, we had different parameters we had to follow um, with extraction and bottling this year. So we have these uh, plexiglass shields and everyone had a box of honey and it's about 20 bottles per box. And we all do the labels, sticker labels, nutrition label on the back and then our logo on the front. Um, and our finished product. So we have gallon jugs that we had this year that we have sold in bulk to people as well as give some back to Purdue Dining to use in the dining courts. Um, and then we have next to that our eight ounce honey bottle. So this is our finished product. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to me, Eric, and as well as right now in the chat. That was really great, thank you. Uh, you did get a few questions come up. Uh, so I'm just going to ask you both, uh, both those. Uh, but just as people are um, typing them up, oh, there we go. Okay. So uh, Allison, Eric, uh, one of the questions was leaving the honey to sit after you've, uh, after you've extracted it. Um, do you need to let it sit after you extract it? What's the benefit of doing that? So this would be when it's in the bulk holding containers. Yeah, the benefit for us was that we had a uh, volunteer work staff. We had a volunteer crew and it was a long day to extract all the honey and we needed to have a little downtime in between. So there was a personnel uh, benefit, but also having time in a hundred degree environment allows some air to escape from that product. We didn't want to have creamed honey. We didn't want to have anything that would be, you know, uh, 
other than very, very clear, um, I guess, consumer grade honey when, in what we were doing. So we wanted to make sure that if we had any floaters that we saw those come up to the top. And so having a little bit of time gave us a couple of different benefits. Great. Um, so I, I've really enjoyed uh, this collaboration because, uh, you know, I, I'm approaching this as a bee scientist and a beekeeper, and you're, you're both approaching this as food scientists. So, so my question for you is what has been the biggest challenge working with honey relative to other products? Well, um, a big issue. Oh, well, go ahead, Allison. I was just going to say, um, I think at the beginning, a challenge was, especially for me, because I don't have bee experience. And at first, I didn't know what it was going to be. But um, I definitely feel like we have learned through both sides, um, through the extraction side and learning how to do that, and then going into processing, um, and kind of meshing those two worlds together. Um, I definitely feel like we've all learned a lot through just thinking about food safety as an aspect that you wouldn't normally think about if you were just doing it as like a home extraction. You have to consider um, wearing like PPE and different things like that. Right, right. Yeah, that's, that's uh, a really say good point. In, in, in terms of food process engineering, wow, we got to deal with a lot of fluid dynamic problems with honey. Um, it's not like a soup or a sauce or a beverage where you have a, a definite range where you're expecting a lot of thickening and a lot of uh, crystallization. It The crystallization hits really, really high. It hits at like, as soon as you get past 80 Fahrenheit, you got trouble, right? You start getting some crystals when you get into the, the 70s, when you get into the 60s, you get a ton of crystallization and it just changes the flow dynamics such a lot um, that uh, like we had mentioned the, the pressure, um, the, the actual crystals in the honey were uh, breaking up the screens last year. So last year we'd have inline screens. We would put them in there to try and get out the, the B parts or anything that might've ridden in on the, on the frames and the, the screens were failing. And we got to looking at it, the screens were failing really because of the crystallized honey more than any contaminants, physical matter. So um, I would say they're very challenging fluid dynamics to consider when you do commercial processing of honey. Eric, this is Matt Evans here. Um, real quick, um, I don't know much about the process, but I do know there's a process called pressure filtering that a lot of b processors use, and it rearranges the honey, but it doesn't cause a chemical reaction like you're going to have with heat, no matter how quick you heat it up and cool it down, you're still going to have a chemical reaction. And I'm afraid heating it to 160, whatever, is, um, you know, if you analyze that again, it's not going to really be real honey. But that's just my two cents there. But I do know of um, a, a pressure filtering process that then, as it rearranges the sugars and the, um, it then does not want to recrystallize. And there's no heat involved in that. I mean, there may be heat in the friction. I don't know how yeah. that is. What but temperature are you running the pressure filter? I don't know. I'm not. Like I said, I don't do it. We um we don't um we just um, reheat our honey in barrels as it crystallizes and um. And then I see, I see. we used to have a, what's the micron filter you think? We have a really, um, it's a, um, just a um, so sock filter that we wash in a laundry machine um, that, um, that we use in it. We, each one, um, the canister is about six inches in diameter and probably 24 inches tall. And um, we have a gear pump and we pump it through there. And then each one's good for about one barrel of honey. Mm. Well, so we put it all right in barrels and then let it crystallize and as we need it we heat it to under 110 and um and then we just um filter it that way but it will crystallize again within a few months but yeah. i just know are you using a pack. drum warmer then to heat to heat the bulk drums or are you just using an electric warmer on the outside we have a box that um will hold five barrels at a time and so um okay if it's if it's all um if it's cold outside and the honey's really really cold when it goes in crystallize it takes four or five days to warm five barrels at that temperature. Yeah, and ours is much more in line with a HTST, a high temperature short time uh, process. Uh, and it really does meet all of the criteria for commercial pasteurization. Um, if anyone wanted to ask if it's a pasteurized product, technically yes, but we're not doing it for any kind of a microbiological risk um, because it's inherently you know, an antiseptic product. It's, it's not going to be a micro risk. 
Um, it's but dry. you're right. You're right that the crystallization is dramatically um, changed. The we even seeded some. Uh, didn't you have a uh, Crispin seed some honey and see if we could force it to crystallize after the process? And I don't think that really went so well. I think it, it didn't crystallize at all. So yeah, yeah, there are fundamental changes to like the the three carbon sugars versus six carbons. So you're looking at carbon chain length adjustments. You're looking at a lot of different things that happen when it sees that thermal load. That's why we try to keep it so brief. That's why we're at 60 seconds. We looked at about a dozen different uh, publications uh, in different academic journals and said, well, which which process are we going to mirror with this? We went with one that was uh, TOSI, T-O-S-I, at Al, and I can uh, provide that after the fact so everyone has the same reference material. Well, I know the biggest question we get all the time, is that raw honey? And what you're selling there is not gonna be raw honey. No, no, So that's not at all. I'm just saying for the, for the fact of what I think the consumer, what I hear the consumer wants right now is raw honey. Um, yeah, you're right, and, and we, we make no uh, claim that this is a raw honey product. Last year we ran a truly raw honey. Uh, we barely had any heat. And like I said, it'd be a hundred degrees, uh, maybe a hundred Fahrenheit at the most last year. Um, and it was all just filtration. It was inline filters and separations and bottling. So last year was a truly raw honey and we got a ton of crystallization um, in the bottles. Um, yeah. And this year we've had no crystallization in the bottles. I think this is actually a really good uh, segue point for, uh, for Matt to go up next. We've got lots more yeah, questions please. for, for uh, Eric and Allison. Um, and I, I'm gonna add actually just one additional point. We've had a lot of fun with the Boiler Bee product, just listening to, to the consumers who are purchasing it. Uh, and one of the biggest points uh, with the raw honey was, the, was crystallization. They love the raw product, but not so much the crystallization. Uh, so, so this year was kind of a fun little experiment to try uh, a thermal process and see what we could uh, what we could come up with there. Uh, yeah, I'm so it's sure been really have no problem marketing the yeah. Purdue honey. Actually, yeah, I have no problem at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's only an on-campus product though, so we we try and make sure that it's just for students and, and people on campus. Uh, but with that, Matt, I think we should transition to you. So Matt Evans is a commercial beekeeper. He's joining us from uh, where are you today, Matt? Are you just outside of the apiary? I'm in. Um, not, well, I'm at the, I'm at our shop today, right? We just came back in to pick up some more feed. We're out feeding bees, so um, we're um, it's in La Fountain, Indiana. It's um, between Wabash, Indiana, and Marion, Indiana, about 40 minutes from Fort Wayne. Um, and so um, I'm at our extracting facility and our storage facility. Um, we have bees here sometime of the year, but when it's honey extraction season, we have no bees in the area. You can't have. Um, honey bees around your honey processing facility. Yeah. So there's no so bees Matt, here. Uh, Matt brings today uh, two videos. These were filmed by a local news um, uh, news organization. And, and what we're going to do, they're both short. They're both about a minute long. And we're going to play the first one, which is the outdoor uh, work that Matt and his team does. And then we'll, we'll let Matt um, pause it and go through it a few times there. And then we'll play the next one. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, let's hope this works. <laughs> I'm on my phone only... and I'm illiterate to this. So. <laughs> no worries, Matt. I got it. Uh, I'm just the only one on this uh, panel today who hasn't tested their share mode. Let's see. There we go. Can anyone, everyone just see the Clover Blossom uh, logo there? I can see it. Excellent. Okay. And it's big enough? Full screen for me. Full screen. Perfect. Okay. Here we go. So hopefully... This plays, and there we go. This is, um, that's our truck with a lift gate. Um, there's four of us out in the field. Um, the red thing is a, um, a bee blower. The black boxes you see on top of some of the hives in the front there are fume boards that we put butric acid on. Um, so we go, to the, we go to the bee yard. We're gonna take every bee box, every honey box that's on these hives this day when leave the brood nest itself, the lower two boxes. We only pull the honey one time a year from each from the yards, and that starts July 30th, approximately. That's when that started this year, and we finished um, last Friday. Um, wow. Four days a week um, for how many ever days that was. Um, the fume board that goes on top drives the bees down, 
this is um Dave Shinnefield, the owner of the business. Um, and he's just showing the camera full frame of honey there. We run eight frames in all of our honey supers and 95% of our honey supers are what we call Illinois supers, six and five eighths inch mediums. Um, we take them to the truck, we load them up on the lift gate. The only time we handle those heavy boxes is the times you see us walking them to the truck. They are dollied the rest of the time, um, even into the extraction facility and up to a lift. Then we handle each frame individually at that point. Um, we can play that quick video again if you want, Brock. Um, while I, I'll talk still. Um, Let me know if you want to pause. Okay, I don't think I need to. Um, so, um, Honey Robber is um, what the product is, um, the brand of the product, um, which is the butric acid we put on the fume boards. And then, like I said, we have a bee blower. Most of the bees are gone, but we um, we have a separate crew in the extraction facility. And they're not wearing protective equipment, so we try to get most of the bees out of the boxes before we take them back into them. So that's what we use the blower for to, to blow the last of the bees out. Um, we also treat the bees at the same time as we pull the honey for our, their first fall treatment. And um, we use a combination of um, an amitraz based product, um, which is Apivar, and we also um, use Formic Pro. Um, this year, when we pulled the honey, we put a Formic Pro pad, a single pad on each hive on the top. Our lids that go on our hives have rims and a, a spacer that raises them up about a half an inch off of the top bars. That's to accommodate a pollen patty. Our, um, we, what we do is we produce honey in Indiana. And at this time of the year now, we're getting our bees ready to go to California. We send eight or nine semi loads of bees to um, the Central Valley of California to pollinate almonds um, starting the 1st of November. So we can't leave any honey on, supers on the hives, I'll say. Um, we hope that they have some weight in the bottom boxes when we pull the honey, but um, we have to have them straight to stack on a semi. We can't leave a honey super over here because that hive's a little light. We'll go, we go back and feed with corn syrup after we pull the honey, and that's what we're doing now. And um, so that's uh, the first video is just kind of a quick overview of how we um, pull the honey um, from the bee yard. We um, only top super, if anybody was curious about that, we never take a super off a full super and put an empty super under it. We just go to the bee yard and um, we visit them about once every week, every hive during the honey flow season. And, um, and one super at a time, we don't go, oh, that hive's really doing great. We'll put a couple of free supers on that. We never do that. It's one super at a time. We get back and check them again. Um, and now that we got the next video up and we'll go to that. So after we, bring the truck into a loading dock at our shop here. I'm not, I don't think the, there's a hot room that's towards me in this video and they're not going to show that. Um, and um, all the, the stacks of honey go into that hot room for at least overnight where there are dehumidifiers and fans. Um, for the most part, we don't have a moisture problem with our honey because we're extracting honey that was started to be made in mid-May and has been being made all summer. So there's plenty of really dry honey in there if there is some wetter honey. So it goes into the hot room overnight. And then um, well, I'm gonna start this video over again here. It's just about to end. And, um, and the first um, segment is where the honey comes to our uncapper. So there's um, here, the employees laying there some wax. Okay, so, this, so you see this, um, the fellow here on the right, he's taking frames out of the, each box, dropping them on a, um, conveyor that's kind of like like a pizza oven or a um, sub making machine whatever um, conveyor and it's a gunnus chain uncapper there you can see and it takes those through there and there are two sets of flails one on top and one on the bottom and they're chain flails they're spinning very fast and they rip the wax off the frames come out this side two people are on that side of it one person is scraping the bottom bars and just checking to make sure that all of the honey has been uncapped if the honey hasn't been uncapped, let's take his hive tool and just scrape it real quick and that's that. Hands it off to the next person. They stack in the rack. And um, while the spinner, so our spinner is, um, let's go, can you back up at all, Brock? Got right it there. Pause yep. right there. So pause there. So the spinner is a 120 frame radial extractor. And if you put medium frames in, it'll hold 120. Um, 
deep frames, it will only hold maybe 100, holds less. Um, and so it is a 15 minute cycle it runs. So while that's running, you can see to the right of it, then they're stacking new ones in to get ready. Um, we unload to the left into the empty boxes and um, then reload on the right there where you see that door open. Um, all, let's go, we'll pause it right there for a second. Um, so all of the honey and wax, whether it's coming from the uncapper itself at the beginning that you saw, or if it's draining through that um, holding station where the frames are stacked, or what's even in the extractor, all runs to a central tank. And it's, it's, it's not in the ground, so it's not a sump per se, but it's a stainless steel tank, tank that sits at grade and all, everything flows back into that. And then a large Moino pump, we call it, pumps all of that up and through a heat exchanger. The heat exchanger is a 12 foot long aluminum tube that has 21 stainless steel tubes inside of it that are 12 feet long. And they're surrounded by hot oil. The honey goes, and honey and wax and whatever else is in there goes through those tubes. And it's heated. And typically that the oil in that's running around 120 degrees, depending on the temperature of the honey that's coming in, um, Typically the honey going through there is 85 to 90 degrees when it drops. And it's gonna come over through that ex heat exchanger, be heated to it between 85 and 90, and then it drops through this tube and it's dropping into there, it was called a Cook and Beals wax separator. This is spinning even faster than the honey extractor. It, it's spinning incredibly fast, this machine. The honey's dropping straight into the center and the wax. The honey gets hits the outside of the in the inside of the outside of the drum and runs through some spigots and then um, runs into a, a tank where you can see that orange cord. There's a side tank on there and um, the wax is collected on the inside of the drum where there are some some knives and we um, you just um, you can crank the knives in and out and it shaves the wax just a little bit at a time and drops dry wax cappings out the bottom into a container. And then the honey goes on over to a 300 gallon stainless steel settling tank, which is where the barrel of honey sits. Um, so at that point, almost all the wax is out. Yeah, so you can see the bottom of the stainless steel tank there, the round bottom a, a barrel of honey. So then all the honey goes into 55 gallon drums at that time, completely unfiltered. There is some wax in it. Um, and then we um, just um, seal it up tight and store it until we're ready to um, heat it. Even if it's not crystallized, we still heat it to around close to 110, not quite. Then we filter it through the sock filter and then we either um, put it into um, five gallon buckets for customers or bottle it into um, you know smaller containers. And I think at the end of this video, after this weighing of wax, it shows our, um, our only retail station. We have about 4,000 hives and there's our retail. <laughs> um, it's an honor stand um, and people, it's been there for 45 years and people come from all around to buy honey off that table. Um, so um, just, um, I'll back up real quick. I was gonna say this in the beginning, but we got, I started talking with the video. So I'm um, just gonna say we, um, so we're up in Northeastern Indiana. Clover Blossom Honey is the name of the business. Um, we run around between 3,500 and 4,000 hives. We spread those out around 150 different locations here in probably nine counties. Um, 24 hives to a bee yard. They're on pallets like you saw in the first video so that we can transport them whenever we get ready to go to California. And, and we go to California in November. We're there until the end of March when the bees come back to Indiana to us and then we get them ready to um, to, we make our splits, um, fix our dead hives, and prepare them to go um, out to the honey production areas. We do do one apple pollination contract, small, 24 hive job, very, very small. Um, and then we do a 300 hive um, contract on blueberries up around Elkhart, Indiana. It's an organic blueberry farm. And so we, um, it's really dry sandy soil up there and in the springtime in Indiana you never know um, 
And so we can always get rid of 300 hives quick in a dry area um, if, when we start to have to move bees out of our holding yard. So that's the main reason we do, we do that, John. So. That was really great. Thank you so much, Matt. You have a bunch of questions. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, um, I'm gonna get in the truck because okay. we're on it. We're working today, and we're gonna go right, feeding. Right, right. And I'm gonna just do that from the truck. The camera might get a little shaky, or I can turn it good off, thing. whatever. But, um, but, um, hopefully, we'll maintain a good connection on the um, AT and T. Is um, it's their fault if not. <laughs> we'll send them complaints. One quick sure. question, just as you're as you're packing, yes, uh, and then as, yeah. So, how many people work for Clover Blossom to tend those four thousand colonies? Okay, um, there are four beekeepers. Um, out in the field, um, myself, um, and then um, the the boss, Van Dave Shinnefield, his son Derek, and another fellow, um, Gary Gunnan, um, who's a, a friend of Dave's and has worked here a long time. And in in the office, in the in the shop, there are two employees full time, and then we add one during the extraction season um, because it takes three people in the extraction room. Great, thank you, Matt. That was really, really informative. Um, I'm gonna just, uh, what I'll do here, we're just coming up to the end uh, end of our session. It's uh, 1.03 and I'm gonna try and pick off some questions for the panel here. And I don't wanna take too much more of everyone's time uh, today. So panel, thank you so, so much. That was, that was quite a lot of fun uh, to get all of those, um, the, the, uh, to get all of your perspectives. Uh, I guess, what I'll do is just dive right into the questions. So uh, Tom, we've got one for you actually. Uh, do you run into any legal issues with hives on rooftops or near companies? Any liability or risk issues? No, I mean, I do carry insurance to the Ontario Beekeepers Association. My biggest concern with the rooftops is I've had a, um, a telescopic lid blow off a roof. And ever since that happened, um, Thankfully, there was no nobody injured, no property injured. But ever since that time, I keep, if you notice from my photos with the feed pails, I keep very heavy paver stones on top. And one roof that has a little more wind than the other, than the other, I actually ratchet strap them down for the winter. So, uh, but as far as legal issues, no, I do carry, carry, carry insurance. But my, my biggest concern, like I said, is, is uh, you know, something blowing off the hives. And I, I deal with that. Um, this is for the panel uh, generally. What, uh, and this, uh, this is from Chris McGee. And I'm going to assume that Chris McGee might be in Indiana. So uh, what is the best time of summer to harvest honey to give the bees a chance to replace what they need for the winter? So uh, answer this just knowing that this might be someone from Indiana <laughs> in terms of time of year issues. Uh, this is for the panel. So Matt, if you if you want to jump in, feel free. But Tom, you're more than welcome to as well. I'm sorry, say the question again. What time of year should you pull honey uh, to ensure that the bees can uh, uh, can build up again? Um, well, you need to all obviously make sure that the honey is um, the right moisture content before you even think about pulling the honey because um, it's really, really hard, difficult to dry the honey um, off the hive in the combs. Um, and it's even more difficult to dry it in a bucket. Um, so you wanna make sure the honey is at least 18% or less moisture content before you're gonna extract it. And in Indiana, a rule, good rule of thumb is that your tree and your bush honey is always gonna come in dry. So that's gonna be your early stuff. So if you wanna extract multiple times, you know, you can um, check, you check that honey and it, it's probably going to be really dry. Um, just tree and bush honey comes in dry. Um, and then, and that's the biggest honey crop in Indiana. That's what those two create, produce a lot of honey. Then your, your wildflowers and your wheat flowers and your soybeans, yes, soybeans produce a tremendous amount of honey in certain areas of Indiana. It's going to come in at a higher moisture content. Um, and it's going to take the bees long, and it's going to be a more humid time of the year typically, and so it's going to take the bees some more work to dry it. So, it, um, if you're looking to have different flavors of honey, and you're going to extract it um, different times of the year, I would say that I would look to want to have all my honey off 
I stopped my 70 and then can't buy the end of the book if I oh. but you're not really going to make much honey after that. He's, he's he, Matt, you're keeping enough. it a secret from us. You cut out a little bit. So what uh, what uh, time of year do you pull the honey? So if I would, um, I would try to get it off by the end of July if it was dry enough and I had, didn't have too many hives that I um, that I couldn't get that done. Because then you can get a treatment on the bees, and that's important if you're treating your bees. Um, and but like I said, you just need to make sure that the moisture content is 18% um, or below before you do it. And um, and if it's not, then you need to leave it on. And um, and it may take into August to, um, to get the honey moisture down. So it really just depends on the area and the, and the year that we're having. And every year is different. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Uh, okay, I so I'm not I, cutting I think... out. We're driving again. No, you're good right now. Uh... So, so final, uh, I guess we'll, we'll call this a final question because we are, we are pushing uh, a little past our time here. And this is for the whole panel. Uh, actually, I'm kind of curious about Allison and Eric's perspective, uh, but Tom, I think you've probably got a good answer for this one too. Uh, this is from Toby Reynolds and Toby says, I don't yet have bees, but wondered about uh, the cost of an extractor and if, if Toby actually needs one. Do you need an extractor? I would say yes. Your, your only other option is to do crush and strain and um, you know and you can you can get some pretty inexpensive extractors now two and three frame extractors for um, you know two hundred dollars my I think my 12 frame manual extractor was quite a good deal I paid just a little more than five hundred dollars for that and it's a 12 frame extractor so but okay yeah great. you can process honey with an extractor but it's yeah. not something I want to do. <laughs> nor nor I. Of, quite a lot of work. You know, boiler B, I mean, we, we couldn't really do it without an extractor. We've got to have that centrifugal force. We've got to have that, that mechanical separation of the product uh, out of those frames. Um, I've done some crush and strain with top bar hives uh, at home, uh, certainly not in the context of Purdue. And so it was stacking perforated pails and putting the crushed up you know, honeycomb in and just letting gravity and time work, it takes ages. I got a good product, but man, it took a while. Um, so that was the only way that I could perceive doing it without the extractor. So I definitely concur with Tom, but if, if you've got any kind of volume, it's completely impractical uh, to think about doing this without a proper extractor. I have seen some pretty cool homemade extractors out of bicycle wheels and things like that. If you got a real, if you got a crafty bone in your uh, body and you got a, a little bit of a small scale startup operation, there are a lot of uh, novel ways to do the extraction without spending a bunch of money um, on equipment. Great. What do you think, okay. Allison? I, th I agree. I think if you are extracting a large volume, you'd want an extractor because it takes a lot of time and if you don't have enough people to help too as well, especially we notice that, um, then it can be longer. Um, and if you're on a timeline, I feel that having an extractor would really help you um, get a lot of yield from your frames. Yeah, thank you both. Also, uh, and then, uh, oh, go ahead, Tom. See, I was just gonna say briefly that also most uh, local beekeeping clubs, uh, one of the benefits of joining a club is quite often they have a club extractors to loan out to beginners. Great. That's exactly what I was going to follow up on. Thank you so much, Tom. So uh, to everyone in attendance, uh, I've just put a little link in the uh, chat. Uh, that's our standard form at the end of these uh, sessions for you to let us know what you liked, what you didn't like, uh, and also tell us um, anything you'd like us to, to uh, follow up on, any, any other uh, topics you would like for these sessions. So please fill that out. It's really useful for us. Uh, the final session, uh, the final um, webinar is next week, and it's on uh, preparing colonies for the winter. Uh, so please join us for that. We're going to take a little break after that one, and we're going to pull together all of the data we have from these forms, and we're going to put together uh, another five webinar series on uh, the most popular topics that you've sent us. So I can say that we've already got one speaker lined up, and it, I'm pretty excited to have, uh, to have them come and join us. But you'll, you'll hear more about that uh, in the future.
Uh, with that, thank you so much panelists. I really appreciate you taking your time uh, today to put this together um, and for, uh, for really driving this, this whole series. So thanks so much, uh, Tom, Allison, Eric, and Matt. Uh, enjoy the rest of your days and thank you uh, attendees for sticking around. Thank you, Dr. Harper and everyone else. Thank you. Thanks again.